All right, well, why don't we uh, go ahead and get started? We've got people on uh, Zoom as well. Uh, just a quick one or two uh, just comments about uh, this. This is part of our annual retreat symposium of the Cobre Grant title cadre for which Peter Monti is a PI and Jen Tidy and I are part of the uh, group and we have a whole bunch of faculty that are involved. Uh, this is also uh, part of CAS Rounds and coming in the spring, uh, actually Lauren is here, I just saw her, Lauren Michalese, anyway. Just a, yes, I just saw her a second ago and she just sent me an email yesterday. We're gonna try to get more in-person people in the spring and have Cadre um, sponsor those since we uh, have the uh, resources to do that, that's part of our grant. Uh, without further ado, uh, we'll have Jen Tidy introduce our speaker. Jen uh, knows our speaker very well, and so we thought that would be a perfect way to do that. It's always an honor to introduce your friends. So, Jen Tidy. Thanks, thanks, Jazz. Hi, everybody. I'm Jen T Tidy. I think uh, most people know me. I'm associate dean for research at the School of Public Health, and also professor of uh, BSS in CAS. And it is by my very big pleasure to introduce Steve Higgins. I was a uh, T32, um, NIDA T32 postdoc with Steve um, and the University of Vermont um, in the late 90s, so quite a while ago. And we've been pretty much consistently collaborating since then, especially over the past two years on two centers, especially one tobacco center. So Steve uh, Higgins, I'm, I'm sure, okay, I, it's a little echoey, that's all. Okay, it is for me, okay. Uh, Steve uh, has been tremendously successful by any measure that we have in academic uh, research. He's led dozens of NIH grants as PI, including a prestigious um, merit award, which pe people may know, takes your five-year grant and converts it to 10 years, because I think it's so spectacular. And these are few and far between, and Steve led one of them. He's led a T32 for 30 years. Um, and over the past decade, he's led two centers, one Cobre Center and one a, a Tobacco Center of Regulatory Science that I've had the pleasure to be involved with as well. He's mentored dozens of pre- and postdoctoral trainees. Um, he's, of course, had hundreds of pub publications, and he's won, he's, he's received um, prestigious awards from prof professional societies, including the Nathan B. Eddy Award, which, given by CPDD for, you know, career achievement. And so Steve wears a lot of hats, and these are not jaunty little caps. These are big <laughs> hats. And yet one really impressive thing about Steve that I've observed over, you know, the whatever 20-something years that we've worked together, that he has the capacity to take the time to listen to trainees very closely when you're speaking. We just experienced that in getting feedback from our, our cadre um, faculty to listen closely and attentively to the mentees, to look at his data very closely atten and attentively and, and think about what it is teaching us about addiction. And so I'm so thrilled to have him today. And uh, Steve Higgins, please come up. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here and I'm thrilled to be introduced by Jennifer, who, as she mentioned, we've been working together for decades. And uh, so great, and thanks for being here. So as you see um, in my slide here, I'm gonna be talking about how to leverage the reinforcement process uh, to improve health. Okay, so um, the only thing I, I wanna mention is, is my NIH support. I have nothing else to declare. Um, what I'm gonna present is team science. I've been very fortunate to have um, tremendous faculty collaborators and pre -doc, post doc and pre doc collaborators. Um, so I'm going to start give some his, give some historical context and work my way up to the present. So um, I kicked off my career when there was a cocaine epidemic, much like the current opioid epidemic. So this was the mid late 1980s um, and into well. It never really went away, but we'll get there. So when the cocaine epidemic first hit, the scientific and clinical communities were caught totally off guard. Um, it's crazy to have to think back on it, but we didn't even realize that cocaine was addiction, was addictive. And Eric Clapton was singing songs about cocaine, and the um, athletes and movie stars were using it, but we soon found out that it was. And, um, 
and the phones were, were ringing off the hook in clinics with people demanding treatment for cocaine dependence. And the, everything in the toolkit that was tried failed miserably. And so that's all we knew. And then NIDA, the NIH was panicked. Um, HIV was raging at that time. And cocaine was being used intravenously. So they put out a call for uh, proposals on how to treat cocaine dependence. And we were all thinking it had to be in an outpatient setting because demand was just too high and the evidence on inpatient treatment re really wasn't encouraging. So I was a new assistant professor at, at the University of Vermont and Warren Bickle was there and John Hughes. So we were all, we wouldn't grant money really, but we were thinking, geez, what we know about cocaine's neuropharmacology, it seems like it's going to be pretty hard to get a medication that's sufficiently specific to reduce cocaine use, but leave other aspects of everyday human behavior intact. So we had nothing against pharmacotherapies, but we opted for a behavioral therapy. And it's still the case today that we have no effective pharmacotherapy. So, so the guess was in the right direction. And so um, we built, we were trained behaviorally in behavioral pharmacology. So we built the treatment that I'm going to share with you around the um, motivational process, the reinforcement process, which we understood to be key to driving cocaine use. It was cocaine's very potent reinforcer. That's why it's so addictive. So the, the treatment that we, we developed eventually ended up as a, a manual the Community Reinforcement Plus Vouchers approach. And it's still available um, on the NIDA website, free. You could download it. You've got to hunt around to find it, but it's there. So what we were recommending is someone uh, sought treatment with us, that they would stay um, in touch with the clinic for approximately one year. The most intensive part of the uh, treatment was going to be in the first 12 weeks. We were going to ask them to come in for twice weekly counseling, three times weekly urine toxicology testing. And with that regimen of urine tox testing, we felt we could pick up any cocaine use. Um, and then um, we were going to focus on trying to teach them in these counseling se sessions how to derive reinforcement from the community that would sustain um, behavior change and sobriety longer term. And this community reinforcement approach is a treatment that was very effective for severe alcohol use disorder, and we were adapting it uh, for use with cocaine. And um, then in the second half of, treatment, uh, second half of this 24-week treatment period, we would start decreasing the frequency, so they would come in for just once a week counseling and twice weekly urine toxicology. And then after a 24-week period of, that we were calling treatment was over, then we would go to an aftercare period. And they would just stay in touch with the clinic, some random urine tox uh, tests, and uh, check-ins with the counselor. All right, so we, we anticipated, because cocaine is such a potent reinforcer, that we were going to need something to engage them in treatment while we just did this community reinforcement therapy. So we came up, we weren't sure how to do it. There's no medication like methadone that's reinforcing to keep them in. So we came up with this idea of a voucher-based contingency management program. So um, the, as you see at the top bullet, we start out, uh, if, if you can give us a cocaine negative specimen, you were going to earn these um, vouchers, just slip a paper, and they would be worth um, a quarter, 10 points a quarter each. So $2.50 for the first time you could show us that you, you've abstained from cocaine. And then um, the value would escalate with each consecutive cocaine negative specimen that you could give us. And what we were trying to do there is reinforce continuous cocaine absence. So we operationalized what's good treatment. Well, you have a cocaine use problem, and we could get you not to use cocaine for um, sustained periods of time. Then, um, because the literature was showing how hard it was, if someone could abstain for an entire week, we would make a big deal about it. They would get a bonus voucher worth $10. There are a lot of social reinforcement um, with it. And then if they uh, use cocaine or fail to give a scheduled specimen, then they would, the, the value of the incentive would go back to the initial low value. And there, all we were trying to do is just 
If someone's tempted during a, a period where they're doing well, just give them a little reason to stop and think about it. You have something to lose materially by, by um, uh, using cocaine. So then, of course, they're going to. They're going to be people that have that experience. But then you have to give them a reason to keep trying so they could get back to where they were before the reset if they could sh give us a string of five uh, negative tests. And then if somebody abstained throughout the entire 12-week period, they can make, earn just shy of $1,000 in purchasing power. No cash was ever given. And um, the, the vouchers were exchanged for retail items in the community. All right. So we completed seven uh, controlled clinical trials demonstrating the efficacy of this treatment model. Um, and then we started doing these complementary clinical lab studies. Jennifer was <laughs> helped with some of those, where we would just say, uh, try and understand questions that were too difficult or too simple to ask in a clinical trial. They just didn't warrant it, but were relevant to the work we were doing. And we would use cigarette smoking um, in place of cocaine. It was legal, more prevalent, easier to, to do the studies on. And I'll That'll come up later in, in the talk. All right, so um, the two of the clinical trials that we did compared against standard care. And that was a simple-minded thing, like is this thing we just came up with any better than what's already available in the community? And then, um, so then the later trials, we started um, dismantling the uh, treatment package. So let me, let me briefly take you through the studies. So th this is um, kind of for me to reminisce about these studies. So this was um, the first one that um, we took 38 individuals. It's Vermont. We, we, had, we didn't have large population. We still don't have large populations for these kinds of studies. So we took 38 individuals, and we randomly assigned them to two treatments, this new treatment or the uh, standard counseling, or standard care in our community, which was professionally delivered kind of disease model informed counseling, of drug abuse counseling. And then we had experts in each. We trained the people in the behavioral approach and we hired experts from the community in the uh, standard approach. And then six months of treatment and six months of follow-up. So this graph is, it, it captures what, what we learned and so on the, um, Y-axis is percent of subjects, um, X-axis uh, consecutive weeks of treatment, the new treatment in the filled symbols, the uh, standard care and the open symbols. And this was, the, what happened with the standard care is what you were seeing in the literature. They either stopped coming to treatment or resumed cocaine use uh, almost immediately. What was um, very unusual was what you, we saw with the filled symbols. In fact, when we took this to the CPDD meeting, uh, you know, I don't want to say all hell break lo broke loose, but it was pretty, it got a lot of reactions, let's just say that. Um, and so one of the first questions, well, what's doing this? What's the key contributor? And people were mostly interested in the voucher program, and they didn't want to do CRA counseling. Um, so, uh, so we ran a trial, this time we had 40 people. So that one that I just showed you was published in American Journal of Psychiatry. This one got published in uh, Archives of General Psychiatry, which is now JAMA Psychiatry, so a higher impact journal. And this is where the vouchers really started getting a lot of attention. So um, this, what we did here was um, people got randomized to either get the full treatment package or just the CRA counseling. And what you see here is the mean duration of continuous absence on the Y and different durations on the, on the X. And um, having a voucher program involved doubled the duration of continuous absence. Um, so, so that pretty much told the story straightforward. Settled some of the criticism, like you don't have real addicts in Vermont and this and that. But it's a, it's a long story, but anyhow. Um, it, the evidence was quite clear. And so then what about longer term effects? Um, so what we did here is a study where now we had 70 people, I think, and they got randomized um, 
to either get the CRA plus vouchers treatment that I described to you and been showing, or the same treatment except that they didn't have to be cocaine negative to get the vouchers. And the schedule of voucher delivery was yoked to the group that did have the contingency. So everything is the same. The only thing is different is the first 12 weeks, whether there's a contingency in place or not. And I'll show you, well here you can see that during treatment, it makes a difference on how much continuous absence you get. So the filled bars are the group that had the contingency, open bars, no contingency, but when we followed them up, every time we looked, the group that had the contingency in those first 12 weeks, even though all aspect, other aspects of the treatment were the same, were always doing better. So the top bar is showing um, point prevalence absence for 30-day um, point prevalence. You had to tell us you hadn't used cocaine in the past 30 days and give us a cocaine negative urine specimen. The bottom is showing um, continuous absence across the consecutive um, assessments. And both of them were showing that this contingency mattered. All right, so now um, further question. Not everybody who had the contingency. Um, well, I, I should say one more thing. When we looked at um, who got continuous absence longer term, it was the, who, got, who was going to be absent longer term? It was the people who got the longest duration of continuous absence during the treatment period. And it didn't matter whether you got it in the control treatment or the intervention treatment. It only mattered that you got it. That's pretty interesting. But the criticism of it was, well, people are self-selecting into these groups. So it's kind of simple-minded. You're, you know, you're just saying people who do well early do well later. So what we wanted to do here was create the difference. So everybody's going to come in, everybody's going to get CRA, and they're going to get vouchers, except one group's going to get a higher magnitude voucher, and the other one's going to get a lower magnitude voucher. So we could create, and people are otherwise identical in a randomized controlled trial, we we're going to create different, uh, experimentally, different durations of continuous abstinence. And when we did, you got this. And the, the filled bars, again, are the people who got the larger uh, amount of continuous abstinence or the larger um, magnitude incentive. During treatment, they get greater abstinence. And then out through uh, two years after treatment entry, the groups that uh, the, the, the people who had longer, uh, higher magnitude incentive were more likely to be absent. All right. So because we, we introduced this treatment approach, we got interested, and I have a T32, and <laughs> always trying to find you know, projects for, for the trainees and whatnot, we started doing literature reviews, which anybody who does, they're very time consuming. Um, so the first one, we, we covered in these three reviews, I, I list the citations for here, 24 year period. Um, and so the, you can see the first one was published in 2006, then another one in 2011, another in 2016. And um, a, the point I'm going to bring up here is across those 24 years, there was 176 controlled studies looking at this model in the peer-reviewed literature. And 151 of them, 86% of them, um, reported statistically significant treatment effects. So that's one heck of a lot of empirical evidence for a treatment approach of any type that, that I know about. So um, now connecting with the present. There's a resurgence of psychomotor stimulant use currently, and it's often cut with fentanyl, and it's uh, driving fatal overdose rates. So um, it, as I mentioned, it never really went away. It just kind of, I don't know, quiets down a little bit. Until, and then something else comes up, like opioids, a, a, a very serious epidemic. And, but now it's, it's resurging. So um, walking down the halls before pre-COVID, 
one of our postdocs, uh, Tia Bolivar, approached me and said, hey, are we going to do another one of those reviews? <laughs> First thing I thought it was, oh, God, I don't have time for one of these. But then with some thinking about it, um, I thought, you know, there's this issue of um, both cocaine and methamphetamine, but more so methamphetamine, cut with fentanyl, that it's, in, it's um, a real problem for those who are enrolled in medication treatment for opioid use disorder. It's, it's for people who have opioid use disorder generally, but it's impacting those who are in, in treatment. And it risks undermining all the progress we made in getting medications out and getting people in, in communities that, that weren't used to these medications comfortable with it, and now uh, the, this group is, is using um, stimulants. So we decided we were going to look at um, the efficacy of this treatment approach in the population that's enrolled in medication treatment for opioid use disorder. We're going to look at um, a group of problems that are common in this population, but the psychomotor stimulants is, is, was our top priority. And so uh, we, we tried to do it very carefully because we, we thought it was important. And um, so what I'm showing here are the methods in, in the review. So the search engines shown in the first bullet. Um, in all these reviews, we are looking at prospective experimental studies of the, you know, our operational definition of this type of contingency management. In this, in this review, they had to be undergoing uh, medication treatment. We, um, 74 studies met inclusion criteria, and it was 10,444 participants um, or patients. And um, 60 st of those studies had enough information that we could do, they include them in a meta-analysis. We, we could calculate effect sizes. We followed all the PRISMA guidelines. Um, and we're looking at CM at the end of treatment across six problems with psychomotor stimulants, the one we're going to talk about here. So in these uh, systematic reviews, a forest plot is the typical way data are displayed. And so what we're showing here is, in the first column is, is all the individual studies and then the effect size associated with them. And if you look at the plot, these are um, point estimates um, here. And the way you read these is just um, this zero line is very important. So if the point estimates on the right side of that zero line, it supports that the intervention is having a better outcome. If the confidence interval doesn't overlap uh, this line, then it's a statistically significant effect. And what you see here is, uh, I forget, there's like 19 studies, and 18 of them, all of them, the point estimates on the, on the side supporting the outcome and the um, confidence intervals um, rarely cross that zero line. So what I want you to think about is this is a treatment for which no other treatment still works in, control, un, in a controlled study. And it's not used. <laughs> so we have a fatal overdose cr crisis. We have this level of evidence. And we have people saying, I'm, I'm not supporting that. CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, there could be fraud as though <laughs> That's like something unique. <laughs> so we can talk more about that. But that's, that's partly why we did this. And um, so, all right. The good news on dissemination is there's movement. Um, so the first set of um, priorities from the Office of National Drug Control Policy and the Biden administration listed access to contingency management as one of their main priorities, and that's because of the context of what I just showed you. Um, and then in the second uh, bullet there, uh, California, and, and I really admire this, they just said to CMS, they're large enough to do this. Like, we have a crisis. We're moving forward. You can either <laughs> move forward with us or not, but we're going to do this. We're doing statewide implementation of contingency management for psychomotor stimulant use disorder. And then uh, CMS came around, gave them a waiver, and they are going to do that. And a little scary part of that is 30 years, first paper <laughs> we published was more than 30 years ago, and, and there's been no implementation work. Now, in the largest state in the union, they're going statewide, and that's 
like we'll see how it goes, um, but it is moving forward. Then, like often happens with trends, what California does, other states start doing. So last time I looked, New Jersey was lining up Wisconsin. A lot, of, a lot of other states are moving forward in the same direction, all driven by the crisis of fatal overdose. Um, okay, now remember I said we did these little side studies on cigarette smoking. So they're early career people. <laughs> Sometimes those side studies become big studies. So cigarette smoking during pregnancy is a very serious problem. And um, I, I've been interested for a number of reasons in this problem. So it's uh, the leading preventable cause of poor pregnancy outcomes in developed countries. In the US, the prevalence of cigarette smoking is about 22% um, of women of childbearing age are regular smokers, about 13% of pregnant women. It varies dramatically, smoking prevalence, by educational attainments. It's really socioeconomic status, but that's a good marker. And the um, women who have a GED, it's greater than 40% are smoking. And then if you look at you know, educational levels, like in this room, very, very low prevalence, 8% of college grads, 6% of graduate degrees. And then if you look at women who do smoke, um, and are smoking when they find out that they're pregnant, about one third of them will quit almost immediately. And if you work in smoking cessation, it's really pretty crazy. The cigarettes go down and they don't pick them up for months. Um, but, the, but the other two thirds will smoke right through the pregnancy unless something's done. And if you ask, well, who's putting them down and who's not? Educational attainment, affluence. Um, so if there's women who happen to be smoking, even though they have higher education, they get pregnant on the average, cigarettes go down, but not the, the majority of the women. All right, so I'm gonna take you through a paper that is um, just recently published and available online, not yet hard copy, that's gonna, it's gonna come out uh, sometime this month in a hard copy, in preventive medicine and um, it captures a lot of what we've done over, I don't know, past 20 years. Um, so it's a randomized control trial. And what we're doing is we're comparing best practices, which is like the five A's with follow-up and a referral to the tobacco quit line in Vermont and just about every state in the union. Every state in the union has a, has a tobacco quit line. And so what we're going to do is we're going to randomize um, participants to either get best practices only or best practices plus financial incentives, the voucher program I, I've been telling you about. We have 169 women still smoking at the first uh, antepartum visit, and then we include 80 uh, socioeconomically matched never smokers for purposes of birth outcomes. And you'll see what, what we were trying to learn there. The primary outcome is antepartum absence. The, um, maximum magnitude of the in, uh, incentive someone could earn if they were, we, the incentive program starts, um, most women come in about uh, right at the end of the first trimester, and the incentive program is in place through the antepartum period and first 12 weeks postpartum. Um, maximum earnings of uh, about $1,100 across because the duration is much longer than the 12 weeks we did with cocaine. Um, and the primary outcome is antepartum absence in late pregnancy, at, at late pregnancy. Um, and then we have a lot of secondary outcomes, all of which are in the paper, but I'm just gonna share the birth outcomes, which is really what got me into the whole business of just protecting um, the fetus. And then we, uh, this was the fifth trial that we had done on this topic involving incentives. And so I have a pooled data set looking at the reliability of the effects we see in the current trial. Um, so in the pooled trial, all the women who had incentivized abstinence go into one condition, and all the women that were in a control condition go into a, a second um, group. And they're referred to in the bottom here as um, this, this is those who had incentives, and these are the control. And then the additional thing, we um, hooked up with the Vermont Department of Health, and we got all um, singleton deliveries in uh, 2019, the um, birth records, 
and um, singleton just because that's important for looking at birth outcomes. You don't want uh, multiple births involved. And what we're looking here is at the external validity of the birth effects we see in the trial in the uh, community in which we reside. 2019 was the last year, full year, in the, in the current trial. All right, so that's the background. So the upper um, panel shows you abstinence. The best practices plus financial incentives are in the blue or purple and the best practices in red. And then early late antepartum is here and the bar. This is seven-day point prevalence absence. Woman says she hasn't smoked in the past seven days and gives us a cocaine or cotinine negative urine specimen. So we're, we're increasing adjusted odds of a woman being absent in late pregnancy assessment sixfold by giving them financial incentives. Um, and then we continue the incentives out through uh, postpartum 12 weeks. You get it as you move away from the, the uh, delivery, there's a uh, relapse in both groups. And then out here, 24 weeks, 48 postpartum, there's still somewhat higher abstinence in the uh, group that was incentivized, but not significantly so. Then if you look down here in the pool trials, we couldn't go out to 48 weeks because this was the first trial we went out that, long, that far, but we went out to 24 weeks in all of them. And so what you see is almost identical. So this is a very reliable effect. Um, Six-fold increase by at late, part, late antepartum abstinence by incentivizing uh, drop-off, but you're still getting a, an effect 12 weeks after the incentives are discontinued. So now on to um, birth outcomes. So this is small for gestational age deliveries, and there are people in this audience probably know more, more about SGA than I do, but, um, but it's not a minor outcome. It, it increases risk for uh, sudden infant death in the first year, and it influences health outcomes um, even into adulthood through metabolic disorder. We had talked about that at some point. So what I'm showing here is percent of deliveries that are small for gestational age, and by uh, in the top is the current trial, bottom pool trials. This is getting in a little bit in the weeds, whether you look at all infants or just term infants. And there's some discussion in, in the uh, Surgeon General's report on reproductive health and smoking that you should be looking at term infants. This was the first study where you looked at both. And um, so, but the, it doesn't really change the data. So what you, what you see is in the best practices only, you got um, about 18% of, um, of deliveries are small for gestational age. By incentivizing, you can reduce that, but you can't get it back to never smoker level. And then if you, you know, you get a, by looking at just term infants, you get a crisper um, difference between groups, but you get the same pattern. If you looked in the pool trials, it's very reliable effect. You're, we can, with this intervention, we can reduce small for gestational age deliveries, um, which is uh, um, during the, the pregnancy, it's growth retardation, but when they're delivered, it's small for gestational age. Both the same thing um, and, and bad in terms of health. And then if you look at the Vermont-wide sample, you see this identical pattern, which tells you it's not, it's kind of what I was saying about cocaine, it's not how you get the abstinence, it's if you get the abstinence. And so what we have here, we, got, we can tell from the birth records, we have women who smoked into the third trimester, we have women who were smoking, but they had quit before the, the third trimester, and then we had women who never smoked, and you get the same graded relationship. And then we were eyeing up Medicaid as, as the potential funding source for this, and so we separated out them. But it really didn't matter what, what type of insurance you had. All right, so um, we did a cost-effectiveness analysis led by Don Shepard, who is a health economist from Brandeis University. And um, there's a lot that goes into these, which I didn't have too much to do with other than providing the data. But the take home message is um, the inc incremental cost effectiveness ratios 
um, indicated in the current trial, you are getting uh, about $4.20 return for every dollar invested. And then in the pool data, where you had better estimates of longer term absence for mom, it goes up to $11.90 for every dollar invested. OK. So while the, we were writing this paper up, we had a, a very productive um, early career investigator on our COBRE grant, which it, what brings me here today for your COBRE grant. Uh, Allison Curdy led a study that um, translate this treatment so it could be delivered through a smartphone. So this is a group of 90 women who are recruited throughout the U.S. We never see these women. Everything is, is done remotely. And you by now recognize the outcomes, right? So this is early, late pregnancy outcomes. You're getting you know, significant imp increases by incentivizing. And then you can sustain a postpartum. You take the incentives out, and you're still getting some benefit. And, and we did not look at the um, birth outcomes nationally, but from that Vermont-wide sample, if you're, getting, if you're getting those changes in tobacco, you will get the changes in risk for small for gestational age deliveries. OK, so um, this, this treatment approach this, there's, uh, is called on in Europe. So this is a paper that just came out in the British Medical Journal. It's a multi-site study done in the UK. Um, I forget how many clinics, 17, 18 clinics, showing that you, sc you can scale this up. And when he scaled it, scale it up, they start reducing the frequency of the um, visits where you can deliver incentives and the uh, magnitude of the incentive. And so they're not getting the they're getting the significant differences in abstinence. They're not reporting significant differences in birth outcomes. But I think it's just a matter of getting a smaller effect size, so you're going to have to have a larger sample. But, but yeah. You know, no matter what, like, so some of you may have wondered where, you know, the incentive value, no matter what you choose, if it works, somebody's going to say, can we get that with a lower magnitude incentive? You can count on that. So uh, start with one that works. <laughs> uh, all right, so now I just want to give you a couple instances um, of where you can improve health by leveraging the same intervention, but it's the process of reinforcing um, target behaviors um, that are not substance use per se. This is a paper that was published um, when, in, in just last year in JAMA Psychiatry led by Sarah Heil. And what we're trying to do here is reduce the prevalence of unplanned pregnancies in women with opioid use disorder enrolled in medication treatment for opioid use disorder. They are not currently using a contraceptive. They are, not plan they are sexually active. And they're not planning to get pregnant. That's a bad combination. <laughs> <laughs> and especially when you think of um, the neonatal absence syndrome, how could we prevent that? Well, one of the things we could do is trying to help them with contraception. So Sarah um, is an expert in this area. So what, what we're looking at here is three different conditions. This is usual care in a, in a um, medication clinic for opioid use disorder, which would be a referral. You should be on a prescribed contraceptive, but go somewhere else and get it. And then there's a World Health Organization intervention for contraception where um, the gist of it is you have contraceptive available in the clinic, and they can get it on that same, they could get started on that same day. You don't have to wait to do a physical exam and that sort of thing. And then the third one is this protocol involves the women checking in on side effects of the contraceptive. And apparently, a lot of women discontinue using contraceptives because of side effects. They have bleeding, they have something, and instead of resolving it with their health care provider, they just go off the contraceptive. So what Sarah has done here is she just incentivizes the women to come to, um, when they're in the clinic, to stop in and talk with the nurse at the clinic about any side effects they may be having. So that's it. it they, could, they could have gone off the contraceptive. They could never have gone on it. It doesn't matter if you're willing to stop and talk to the nurse, then you get the, the incentive. So well, here's um, contraceptive use 
prescribe contraceptive use at six months, six months, 12 months, um, and you get these graded relationships, very low if you just do the usual care, more if you do the World Health Organization, and still more if you incentivize the follow-up visits. All right, so at 12 months, same thing. Um, and then long-acting reversible contraceptives, the best in terms of preventing pregnancies, you get that same graded relationship. Um, and then long-acting use, of, that was six months at 12 months. But this is the one that I find the most striking. You now, this is, well, how many of the women had an unintended pregnancy during the study? And now you flip that, that graded curve. And so the highest in the usual care, the next in the um, world health, and then the lowest when you incentivize follow-up visits. All right, cost effectiveness, this same outcome, um, it's a cost effective intervention. Um, and you can see the values there. And it just depends which, which of the three treatments you're, you're comparing, but very cost effective. And now the third example, or second example, <laughs> I want to give you something that doesn't involve uh, intervening substance use. This is cardiac rehabilitation. Some of the physicians, I'm sure, are familiar with this. But it's a 12-week secondary prevention intervention that is cost-effective, life-saving, keeps people from being re-hospitalized. But one major problem with it is people who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, Medicaid-insured patients, do not use it even though their insurance would cover it. Lots of reasons why that may be, but it's a real problem in terms of health disparities. So this, the, it just so happens that the intervention is 12 weeks, and you come three times a week, just like the cocaine intervention. So this is really just putting what we had done with cocaine on incentivizing Medicaid patients to attend and complete cardiac rehabilitation sessions. And what, um, what, what they learn there, they learn how to exercise, these are uh, people who have had a recent heart attack, bypass surgery, or some other cardiac event. And they, the sessions are built around exercise, healthy eating, and um, adherence with your cardiac medications. And so this is just a um, number of sessions here. There's 12 weeks, three times a week. And by incentivizing um, participation, you double the um, proportion of people who are completing this um, potentially life-saving intervention. That too, I can't remember if I include, yeah, that too is a cost-effective intervention. All right, so um, just to wrap up, I uh, think you get the gist. <laughs> I believe incentives represent an important evidence-based tool for promoting health-related behavior change. And um, my message to the healthcare community is we need to wake up because if you want to know of any, like, we're really good at infectious diseases. So you might think, well, what about just COVID? But we, we developed those vaccines in record time. But what undermined the vaccines? We couldn't get a large proportion of the population to take them. It's on the behavioral side. And actually, I wrote a little review paper. There's evidence you can incentivize vaccine adherence, and it works pretty well. So anyhow, um, we, the, um, the, when you use them for substance abuse treatment, you, you want to optimize it. Uh, if you want to optimize the chances of getting sustained change, you want to get an initial period of abstinence. You want to, and that's true for smoking cessation. It's true for whether you use using incentives or not. A lot of times we worry about relapse, but the problem is we have so many people who never really quit or never get a period of sustained absence under their belt. So that's an important one. Um, they're highly effective with vulnerable populations, which is I've spent essentially my whole career working with vulnerable populations. So in that regard, they're important to reducing health disparities. I think cardiac rehab, great example of that. Um, and then. Uh, just for sake of time, I didn't include the tobacco regulatory studies I'm doing with uh, Jennifer, but there too, we're leveraging the reinforcement process. But there, what we're doing is we know that nicotine is the constituent in smoke that drives repeated use and eventual addiction and all the diseases, and it acts through the reinforcement process. 
So the idea is a simple-minded one. Why don't we decrease the magnitude of the reinforcer, lower the nicotine content in cigarettes, you would decrease the reinforcing effects of smoking and make it um, easier for those who are already smoking to quit or those who experiment with smoking, they won't get the same reinforcing effect and go on to chronic use and eventual addiction. So there, it's not limited to contingency management. And um, I think it's this reinforcement process is involved in, in many of the most serious and challenging health problems. I think of it as a trans disease process, and um, I think we need to just do better at leveraging it and producing health-related behavior change. So I will stop there, and thanks for your attention. And from my vantage point, I could see people nodding. So, so um, I'm sure people would like to offer comments, questions. Yes, Rose. Um, this is a what a wonderful program of research and such a huge contribution to to what we know about um, behavior change. Um, For people on the Zoom. Oh, sure. Um, so I had I have two comments. Um, that I'd like you to respond to. One is um, early on, or not even early on, but you talked about and presented the literature reviews. Yeah. Um, and so um, can you speak to one, um, those are published studies, and of course we know there are, for every published study, there's those that have negative yeah. effects that don't get published. So that's yeah. one thing. How might that change those results? Yeah. Um, and secondly, I'm a huge supporter of CM, so I right, right. I say yeah. that. Um, but how do you address the limitation or the con not the complaint, but the concern that after incentives are removed, um, behavior is no longer the yeah. targeted behavior is no longer sustained. Yeah. Um, and I think that with the CMS in California and that pilot, there there. That may help with that, but right. from your perspective as a scientist, those two right, things. Right, right, yeah, great questions. Um, so the first one in these reviews, especially like we got better over time when we, well, I think Peter might be, when we started first doing review papers, we didn't have to do all this stuff. <laughs> so, so now you do all these funnel plots and whatnot to see if you can pick up different types of bias. We're not seeing uh, bias in the direction of studies that are negative not getting published. So that's what we know uh, could, it could happen, but we're not picking it up, um, suggesting it's not happening, happening in a systematic way. Um, the second part is, um, I mentioned earlier that we brought this treatment package to CPDD in our first presentation on this treatment, and people our colleagues wanted to do the voucher part but didn't want to do the CRA part. And our whole intent was that the, the incentives would be a mechanism for engaging, contrived reinforcement to engage them initially while we could do the hard CRA work that we would, that would be important to sustaining long-term abstinence. And I still think that's important. Um, and so, if we um, are going to use these with substance abuse populations, I think we should have, at a minimum, a plan for sustaining absence longer term. Um, and so I violated that in the work with pregnant women because what I found out <laughs> was no matter how much evidence I showed with the CRA plus vouchers treatment that I was getting good longer term outcomes, I would get the questions you say, how, what about they don't work when they're discontinued? As I just showed you, but what about the next meeting? What about, so I thought, well, what's a population in whom it's important if they only work while they're in place? So pregnant women, cardiac rehab are great examples there. So those are kind of my responses to the points you raise. Um, I, I think the, the um, difficulty in getting CM um, 
into community settings. Some of that us investigators created by not attending to longer term outcomes and how to sustain it. The, maybe one last thing I, I would say about it is we've realized that um, with medication, say medication for opioid use disorder, we hoped that we could just detox people short term. And, and we have learned that doesn't work. It's highly effective while it's in place, you remove it. And so we've come to grips like we probably need maintenance interventions. With I think it's the same thing with CM. In fact, same prop population. I can make an argument um, that the mechanism by which buprenorphine and, and methadone work, not exclusively, but mostly, is because they're reinforcers. And what we're doing is substituting a reinforcer that's legal and we can for illegal opioids. But if you remove it you get relapsed. So I think we have to just either do CRA type treatments and try and get people, or come to grips with we have to do maintenance. Yeah, I yeah. agree with you. And yeah. I just think there's other potential. It's like I work with people who are reentering, and, and yeah. there's that very high risk period immediately yeah. after release. And so, you know, the longer we can keep people alive, the longer they're going to stay alive. That's right. Um, and so if you get them through, and I think CM could be very valuable oh, for I those high-risk periods, particularly that two weeks following release. I agree. Um, and then, but you're right, the work has to be done that we are incentivizing more than with just money, but kind of keeping it with that community enforcement, uh, reinforcement yeah. approach. Yeah. 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 Well, oh, and Lorenzo. Bob was first. So, um, thanks. That, that was a that was a great lecture. Thank and you, uh, you know, uh, when I read your first paper, I was bowled over too. It was it was and a fun period. <laughs> yeah, and it even works in inner city Baltimore. Right? Oh, yeah, I didn't I didn't include that. I know. That, I know that was but, one what Bob is referring to. We got these accusations that the reason we got the first <laughs> graph that showed you is we didn't have real addicts in Vermont. And I was just so fortunate to have colleagues in Baltimore where I trained. And so we did a trial in inner city intravenous minority populations and got the same effect. So, yeah. so my question is a little from the away yeah. from the behavioral, but the question is what's going on in the brain here? Yeah. So yeah. the idea is that yeah. In, you know, kind of the assumption is we're retuning the reinforcement mechanism, which has been, you know, disrupted by cocaine yeah. and yeah. or or other other nicotine or, or what, whatever the drugs are. Uh, although the yeah. the, be, the other behavioral stuff suggests maybe maybe it's a general phenomenon. But but uh, the question is 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 there changes in neural circuits that people have actually shown? And the reason why I'm saying that is, is that it may help with the policy thing, that it's kind of like drugs, that it's mm -hmm. you know, it gives you a biological basis yeah. and maybe get away from the policy you know, kind right, of negative right. bias about paying addicts or yeah, you know, sure. uh, for, because you're, 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 you're actually changing the brain and, and yeah. it might help with the, with the adoption strategy. But, right. but so the question is, I haven't seen a lot of data on what, uh, or any actually, but I haven't looked hard, but the question yeah. is, what is going on in the brain with the neural circuits? So I think the first thing that goes on is that um, a lot of vulnerability to the reinforcing effects of drugs, especially those who uh, keep going back repeatedly or chronically, has to do with a bias for shorter term reward. We all have that bias, but steeper bias, steeper discounting increases. So really, we're leveraging that process with the, with the vouchers, because especially in the pregnant women, just think about that. These are pregnant women. If you ask them on a one to five um, scale, how, with five being the strongest, how much would you like to quit smoking? They're like at 4.9. But in the control condition, you see that they can't get it done. And some of the reason is they give in to the short-term temptation to smoke and figure, well, I'll get, I'll get on it later. But right now, I'm going to have my cigarette. And that goes on and on and on. So what, what we're trying to do is leverage this um, vulnerability to addiction to promote recovery. Now, in the longer term, 
I know of some one study, I can't even, I don't even know if it's published, but Ned Nunes and colleagues at Columbia had some data indicating longer term uh, changes in the brain that they could pick up with fMRI. But um, I think the longer term, the brain is probably, I mean, I don't doubt that you get, like the role of sustained abstinence allows people to get, recover some longer term horizons, I think, in how they're making, making decisions. But important for that, I think, are the things that came up about, you know, longer term, how do you sustain longer term absence? You've got to get them in touch with some reinforcers to keep the rest of us from going off in, in terms of, you know, I mean, cocaine would function. In fact, the, the um, evidence is in, like uh, from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health that many of us who have, have used cocaine, what is real, before we knew it, how addictive it was and even after, you know, and didn't go on to have repeated use. But that doesn't mean it wasn't a reinforcer, but we have other reinforcers, professional, marital, whatnot, that compete with it. Um, so, so that is what I think is happening for those who can get sustained absence. But, but just one comment, yeah. and I wonder if though it's not just the reinforcement circuit, but the fact that it enhances delayed discounting suggests maybe it is training cortical inhibition. Oh yeah. Rather than yeah. just the reinforcement at the no, same time. Yeah, no, that's a that's a very good point. I, I don't disagree with that because they are in making these choices. They're, this is their free ranging individuals making choices. But I think um, you know we can push the choice towards the healthier option by just making it um, a sure thing, and um, that they get it if they make the healthy choice. Not you know because some of our our naturalistic reinforcers, right? They make the healthy choice, but they don't get rewarded in any short-term manner. So I think sorting that initially um, would allow the opportunity for those inhibitory processes to recover or to get strengthened. Yep. So Steve, that, that was really wonderful. And so my question is about harm reduction versus abstinence. And right. I know methodologically, of course, abstinence is almost intrinsic to the way how CM works and applies. But as we increase uh, potentially the knowledge about harm reduction, do you see any value in trying to move from qualitative dichotomous to quantitative and trying to integrate CM in a harm reduction model? I don't yeah. know if it's even feasible. Yeah, I, I think um, it's very appealing if we could do it, you know, but evidence-wise, I don't know of much evidence that we know how to do it. Kenzie Preston, at, well you know Kenzie, at the Intramural NIDA Research Center, um, tried for a while, but she, to my knowledge, she never really got it to work in any way that's compelling. Um, and, you know, it, 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 these drugs take on multiple stimulus properties. Jennifer could get into the, but this is getting into lab studies and whatnot. But they can function as both reinforcers and discriminative stimuli. And so when you're trying to get them you know, to reduce, but they're still using, they're putting themselves in touch with the discriminative stimulus for all the things that goes, goes along with using. You know, it's not, it's the chemical reward, but it's all the other things that go along, the social things, it's, you know, using higher doses of cocaine. It isn't like, these guys are using in isolated chambers that <laughs> they can do it, you know, until it all eventually goes south. But there's a lot of, you know, reinforcement that's occurring before things really start turning dark. Uh, so, so I'm not that optimistic, but I don't think it's really been researched enough for me to say it can't be done. And if it could be done for the reasons you're thinking, I think it would be great. We're going to, we have a, a pilot project through our COBRI that we're going to be uh, doing in a needle exchange uh, context where people who, you know, are not asking for anything but a needle exchange, we're going to um, offer them the opportunity for CM. And um, I, I want to see how they respond because they're not seeking treatment. And um, it is harm reduction in that we're just offering them an opportunity 
to do a little better even than, than getting the clean needles. Um, so I'm open, I think you know, we have to be open to harm reduction. Yeah, great, uh, unfortunately yeah. we're out of time. Okay. So, but yeah. Steve will be around for a while. Yeah. Um, and thank you all for attending and for your great yeah. questions. Thanks. Thanks.